and gentlemen, welcome to our third Thursday Mensa Lecture Series. Our Father's Day is coming up, and so it's very suitable that I've invited my own father here. He's a professional musician. He's been working as such for the past 40 years or so. And he's made quite a lot of accomplishments, which he will be discussing tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Spivak. Marimba, you're, you're right. It was actually a caveman noticed 
that it was a dried out piece of wood from a tree, and he took a dried out bone and hit the, the, the wood with the bone, he got a certain sound. And he noticed that if he used a longer piece of wood, it made a lower sound. And if he used a high, smaller piece of wood, it made a higher sound. And gradually, they built up something called the xylophone, which at its beginning was called the straw fiddle. It was actually five or six pieces of wood of different sizes laid out on a bed of straw. So it was only those five notes. Modern xylophones and marimbas are set up like a piano key. They have 12 tones in the octave. They're set up with white keys and black keys. And um, actually, my favorite instrument to play, it comes from that family. It's the vibraphone, the uh, similar instrument that's made out of metal. So you ring and do things with a pedal, play jazz on it and stuff. So you could say that the uh, artistic anthropological roots of today's society came from what you're telling us right now. All music came from you know, that, those beginnings. Wonderful. Long before they had a, a bow and arrow, which you said was the first string instrument, I think cavemen were hitting stones with each other. They were hitting pieces of wood and making music. And you can make a lot of music with just two notes. Sicilian pizza. 
It was to this day the best pizza I've ever had in my life. So I always associate making music with food and reward. And I, I go to parties and they ask me to play, and I love to play for people, and especially if there's food afterwards. <laughs> Uh, I didn't really get serious about music until college. I sort of faked it in high school. I went to James Madison High School in Brooklyn. You too? Yeah, for the Avenue. And uh, we, we kind of had a marching band that would play at the football games. But they didn't have a lot of money for uniforms. So they got these capes, black and white, uh, black and yellow capes. You could wear whatever you wanted underneath the dungarees, white shirt, black shirt, didn't matter. You had the matching capes. But we were really ragtag when we went to play like at the Columbus State Parade with those big elaborate schools with their big marching bands. But I did play for the football games and I played for the school shows. And people ask me how I really learned harmony. Uh, it's actually it's very simple. I had a friend and he had a fake book. Now, a fake book is a book that has literally hundreds of songs. They don't have the traditional three-line piano vocal part, which is the vocal line and the two piano hands. It, they just have the melody line, the lyrics, and the chord symbols. So you, you can cut a song that's normally three pages down to one page, they would just cut out. Anyway, these books were illegal because they didn't pay royalties to the, uh, perform to the composers and authors. Uh, but they were used by a lot of professional musicians because you would ca carry this book in your case and you would play at a party and somebody asked for a song that you didn't know, you could just look it up and play it. Oh, hi. And uh, so at the, at, this was 19, in the 1960s. And there weren't that many Xerox stores around then. And I actually I was scared. He loaned me the book. But I was too scared to take it to a Xerox place because Xeroxing an already illegal book, they, they definitely you know, throw me in jail or something. So I took some music paper and I copied out 400 songs by hand. Not, not, the, not the lyrics, but just the melody and the chord symbols. And I found out that after I did that, I could almost listen to a song and know what the chords were. And I, and I knew harmony and, and the way to get around and modulate key changes and all that. So that was an accident. But uh, a very lucky one. Then when I got to college, uh, I was incredibly lucky. I went to Brooklyn College. At that time, it was free. You went there too? 74, 78. Oh, okay. For first two years, it was free, and then they started instituting a little bit of tuition. Yeah. I was there 71 to 75. I got a bachelor's, so we were there at the same time. And. Uh, the music department was expanding its faculty, and they were spending a lot of money, so they were able to attract some real talent. And my percussion teacher was the cymbal player in the New York Philharmonic, a fellow named Morris Lang, who's still alive. Yeah. Do you know him? Yeah, personally, no, but they had a party or something. Yep. He's afraid of his Arnie. He hated the name Morris. He always thought, you know, Morris. So he had everybody call him Arnie Lang. And Arnie was a real inspiration because he was the first professional musician I met that wasn't doing club dates. And when I say club dates, I mean weddings and bar mitzvahs and other parties and you know, christenings and you know funerals and stuff. Those were pretty lucrative jobs in the New, New York area. Then uh, you would work, you know, on a Saturday night, sometimes a Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, Sunday night. And uh, you know, sometimes you have four jobs a weekend. That was really great. And uh, I was working, actually at that time, there were a lot of drummers. So I bought a combo organ, a Marquisa organ, and learned how to play, sort of teaching myself, because I never played accordion. And I was working pretty much, even though I wasn't very good. And one time, I was playing softball at a music festival without gloves. And I broke this finger. And a couple of weeks later, I got a call from this contractor who would book me for weddings. And his particular specialty was filling in people. Uh, they had a term called a screamer. And what that was is there were normally 
four or five people in a set band. Sometimes the band was so popular, they would book three or four jobs the same night. And they would say, there was one person from the original band uh, to be the same band. And this guy would find other musicians who could fit in well. And uh, we would play. And then he had a code. Like, it, you wouldn't call out the key, because that was unprofessional. The flats were up. So this would be key of F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat. Sharps were down. So you do E, I mean the G, D, A, E, B. And that was, that was our little code. This was played from the top, from the head, you know, the capo. This meant to take it out. This meant to extend the ending a little bit. So it was actually possible to play with people that you had never played with and sound like you've been playing together for a very long time. Well, I got a call from this guy, Nat. And he said, I need you Saturday afternoon. It's, uh, it, it, it's like New Year's Eve. I, got, I, I said, Nat, my hand is still in my finger, still in my cast. He said, oh, I'll get them to help you with the equipment. I, 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 you got to play. So they sent me to New Jersey. They helped me with the equipment. I set up. My finger's in a cast. So I played like two notes with my right hand. Now, the guitarist, he had been used to playing with a pianist who played all over the place and didn't leave him any room to play. So he said, I want you back. I don't care if the hand is broken. <laughs> I love the way that I, that I can. Break it again. <laughs> no, 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 it's here. But while I was, while I had the splint on, Arnie Lang said, you know, we should work on this book, a dictionary of percussion terms used in the symphonic literature. Because professional percussionists, uh, we get the music, sometimes it's in German, sometimes it's in French, sometimes it's in Italian, and you won't even know what instrument you're supposed to play until you either memorize that or you buy the Lang Spivak dictionary published by Carl Fisher. And it was great because I couldn't really do any playing jobs. So I went to the uh, Library of Performing Arts in Lincoln Center every day and did research in their wonderful third floor research collection where they have scores of just about everything. And now, you know, if you look up shell and trommel in here, you'll know that that's a jingle drum. And uh, mit Polschlagel means with a wooden stick. And uh, avec tamba, in French means with snares, snare drum. And all the terms that you need are in here. It's a nice little guide. And uh, it looks like it's like a, a rock book or something, but it's it's actually classical. Why well, they figured it, it was this shape and you're fitting your stick back. So that was great, studying with Arnie Lang. And one of the things that he did, which was great, was he conducted a percussion ensemble, which was only drummers. We would meet every Thursday for two hours. And they had a big room with lots of instruments for us to play. And most of the people in the group were not really percussionists. They were drummers like me, rock drummers, jazz drummers, Latin drummers, that were taking up xylophone, block and spiel, and crash cymbals, and tambourine, and all those instruments. Well, my third year, when I was a junior, Mr. Lang came in, or he came in, and he said, I read this article in Reader's Digest they're sending American, co American college performing groups over to Romania, and they're sending Romanian college groups to tour the US. It was an exchange program that Reader's Digest had set up in 1973. So he said, I sent them a letter on New York Philharmonic Stationery. We'll see what happens. Four weeks later, I'm at the passport office. They send a guy from the State Department to our college to tell us don't bring any drugs, whatever you do. <laughs> and what so, you know. How to, you know, what, what, to, what to bring and, and, and how to be careful, because it was still uh, controlled by the Russians in 1973. So that was a great summer. Uh, I was supposed to play the cat skills the whole summer, playing jazz vibes in a lounge band at the Stevensville Hotel, which I think is still there. And uh, they let me out after July. And uh, that August, uh, I went to Romania, and we played 11 different cities, we had concerts in 11 different cities. We had a bus that would take us around, followed by a truck with all the equipment that we had flown over from Brooklyn College. And we were known as the Brooklyn College Percussion Ensemble. <laughs> and then we <laughs> played the stadium or something like that. Well, we were a big hit. And the government liked us so much that the third week we were there, they decided to treat us to dinner at a wonderful restaurant in Bucharest called the Black Goat. So um, 
got all dressed up. Our bus picked us up, we got to the Black Goat, we walked to this place, and there was a huge ceiling, and there was a band playing, live band, and there were tables set up with a different flag at every table. Like there was a French flag, and they were speaking French, so those were the French tourists, and an Italian flag, and they were all speaking Italian. So we all sat at the table with the American flag. And we listened to the band, and we drank beer at Suica, which is near Plum Brandy, uh, a Romanian Plum Brandy, very potent. It was so potent that one of the guys in my group decided he wanted to sit in with the band. <laughs> so during one of their breaks, he and I walked down to the bandstand. You know, the drummer didn't speak anything but Romanian, but the pianist spoke five different languages. So my friend said, uh, excuse moi Je suis un jazz musicien américain. Oh, jazz musician, cool man. <laughs> uh, and he said, uh, si possible, uh, je voudrais jouer avec vous. Oh, you want to sit in, cool man. Marco, he said to the drummer, oh, 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 oh. American jazz drummer. Oh, 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 oh. So Marco gave my friend the sticks, and he sat in with the band. And I think the tune was Perdido. You know that? And he was swinging, and they were having a good time. So after the tune, the pianist announced, Jazz musician American, and he got a big hand. So then uh, he said to my friend, Oh, you play good jazz. My friend said, C'est rien, it's nothing. In Amérique, tout le monde joue le batteur. In America, everybody plays the drums. He said, No. He says, Oh, we. Oui. Pulled to the table with American flag, one like this, and one by one we came down and sat in the band. <laughs> and the poor drummer was pulling his hair out. I mean, one guy played a real fast swing number, another guy played a hard rock number, Roberto <laughs> played a big, you know, samba, and then our teacher already got up and played sing, 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 and the place went crazy. So we, we finally, we said that we would be in college with a percussion ensemble. And one of the guys ran back to our tour bus and picked up a set of Ludwig brushes, wire brushes. We gave them to Marco as a souvenir. And he started to cry because the Russians who were in charge of the, of the country thought jazz was decadent and they wouldn't allow professional brushes to be sold. So for him to have a pair of Ludwig brushes was like the greatest thing in the world. What a brush. Oh, brushes are, uh, they're, they're also called wire brushes. And instead of sticks, they're very thin strands of wire which are connected to a handle. And you don't really hit the drum with them, you sort of sweep on the drum with them. Like this. So anyway, that was another thing I realized I took for granted, was that in America, we have the freedom to play the music of our choice. So uh, after Brooklyn College, I went to Juilliard, and I got a master's degree there. I was really super lucky. I got to study with a couple of old masters. But uh, I should tell you that we heard that for a good many years in Romania, if you mention the word Juilliard, 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 Brooklyn College. <laughs> At Juilliard, uh, I studied with a real master of the timpani gentleman named Saul Goodman, who, whose famous name has been used uh, on the show Breaking Bad. They have a character, Saul Goodman, if you watch that. Anyway, I told some kid that I was, I had a lesson with Saul Goodman, he said, oh my god, he's, you know, he's that attorney on that show. So <laughs> they, 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 they like the name that they use there. And Saul Goodman played uh, timpani with the Philharmonic for 46 years. He played under all the great conductors. Metropolis, uh, the Bernstein, uh, Zubin Mehta. He had a very long, wonderful career. He designed timpani. He was a timpani inventor. He designed his own mallets. He'd been playing since such a long time. He told me that one of his first jobs, he had to get the timpani to an orchestra hall, and he couldn't find any way of doing it with a motored car. So he brought them on a horse-drawn milkway. Back in the old days of New York. Uh, and I was also very fortunate to study 
with Eldon Bailey, who was the snare drummer from the Philharmonic. And I studied with three of the people in the section that did all those famous Bernstein recordings. I heard a recording of Bolero with Bernstein the other day, and I said, that's Buster playing snare drum. That's his nickname, Buster. He had a wonderful way of, of teaching. In percussion, one of the principles that we follow is called economy of motion. And it means that if you can get the sound from doing this, you don't have to do this. And if you have to play two instruments quickly, put them closer together so you don't have to move your hand as much. Find the angle. And Buster's way of explaining that principle was by saying, don't pay more for it than you have to. Had a, a great way of explaining some things so that they were clear to me. I think the answer is it's already being oh yes you may you may record it if you want to. Oh, okay. uh, after uh, Juilliard, after I got out of Juilliard, uh, which was 1977, with a master of music degree, I joined the ranks of the New York unemployed musicians with a Juilliard master's degree, and. Uh, I did odd jobs around the New York area, playing in some concerts. A lot of uh, churches, you know, they would hire timpanists to masses and, and concerts. And uh, finally, Arnie Lang spoke to a friend of his, and I got to sub my first Broadway show, the original A Chorus Line. Oh, wow. Like in 1978. They had already been running for years. But I, I got to sub in that show. And it was wonderful because not only did I like the show, so much. I'd seen it and I was so impressed. But when I was a kid, my parents brought me to Broadway shows and I loved the sound of the xylophone and the glockenspiel in the Broadway pit. And now, here I was. I was doing it at the Schubert Theater. It was, it was great. Um, I, I lasted in chorus, chorus line lasted another 11 years. So I learned the show and uh, then I played it, you know, not every, not every week but maybe once or twice a month for the next 11 years. And uh, it was just a great show. Um, later on, I got to work for the librarian who worked for Marvin Hamlish. So I actually got to tell him how much I enjoyed his music. And uh, now to date, I said I've been playing music for 40 years, I've played 42 Broadway shows. Six of them have been my own, which is very lucky. They were the original Pirates of Penzance, the one that uh, Kevin Klein and Linda Ronstadt were in in 1970, Joe Patton production. The next one was Tap Dance Kid, which was uh, a score by Henry Krieger, who also wrote Dream Girls. And uh, that lasted uh, two years. Although Pirates, I got spoiled because at the opening night party we got really rave reviews and the show ran for two years without a problem. Tap Dance Kid, when the, they're not making a lot of money in the show, they want the right to, to be able to close it any week. So legally all they have to do is post the closing notice on Thursday and then they can close the show that Sunday. So you opened Tap Dance Yes, I did. Yeah, I have, so far I've been in every room. And, and you know who our, our first tap dance? I, I even have to play. Oh, and our first tap dance kid was the Alfonso dance. Ribeiro. And then they who just won Dancing with the Stars last season. That's Alfonso. And, knew the name, they and then Sabian. Well, what happened was the kids were like ten or eleven. They they got big so fast mm -hmm. that six months after they didn't really look right in the role. So they had to keep getting new kids. And Sabian Glover who became one of the most prolific tap dancers uh, around today. And there's um, another one. It was, uh, it's also on TV now. I see the one. But it'll come back to me. Anyway, that was that was also a great experience. And um, uh, the next show was that I did was um, my favorite year up at Lincoln Center. It was in '92. Uh, then I did a show called uh, Oh, wait, before that, well, I'll come back to that one later. I'm sorry. Uh, Triumph of Love, 1998, which was short-lived. It was a short-lived show. Um, and then I did a show called, uh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Marie Christine, which was a modern retelling of the Medea story. That was also up at Lincoln Center. Uh, 
so those were five musical shows. I played for a non-musical show, which I'll talk about later. I've also been lucky enough to play with the Metropolitan Opera, which is a wonderful place to work. The first job I had there was playing a dress rehearsal of Trovatore, Il Trovatore. And guess what part they gave me? <laughs> a Trovatore? You ever hear the anvil chorus? Yeah. Down, down. Da, da, da. Well, were you on the? Did you were you in the production where they actually had you on the stage? No, that came later. Oh, okay. that came later. I was in the pit on second anvil, so I figured, well, okay, they're going to come down with a big metal plate or you know some tubing or something. They come down with this 500-pound yeah. blacksmith yeah. anvil, like you can see on a cartoon, like Bluto yeah. dropping on, off a roof onto Popeye's head. I mean that that same shape, and two very heavy metal hammers. So I'm standing there, and I haven't had any rehearsal, and the place is filling up because the dress rehearsals have been met. You know, they invite people. Finally, one of the other, one of the older percussionists came down, and he said, yeah, you use the two hammers, swing the light one with your left hand, swing the heavy one with your right hand, let the left one hit a little bit earlier, so you get a kalang. Kalang. It's not just gong, it's kalang. So I learned how to space that. And I said, yeah, but how do I know when to come in? They said, don't worry. The guy who's doing one and three has the hard part. Two and four is easy. <laughs> and he was right. He was right. And, and I did a lot of productions at the Met, both in the pit and on stage. And uh, one job I did at the Met was for Massonet's Manon. I was the horror drummer. In one of the last scenes in the last act, they have a cartload of whores, and they're being deported to Le Havre. Uh, from La Havre to Louisiana, I think. And uh, so I was dressed in full, you know, like a, like, like a real drummer from that time. And when I say I was dressed, this was such a great job. Uh, I didn't have to be there. They started at 8 o'clock. I didn't have to be there until 10 o'clock. And they didn't even want me there because someone else was using the same dressing room who was done by the time the first act was over. So I, I would get into the room. Two dressers would come in with the, the costume and a book that had photos of how it was supposed to look. And they would dress me, and it was like Velcro all the way up with leggings and a coat and a cravat that had to be tied a certain way. And I would get one of the famous men, calfskin, beautiful rope tension tuned drums, and a sling. And at about 11.25, they would, I would hear over the loudspeaker in my dressing room, Stage band drummer, stage left. Stage band drummer, stage left. And you go up the stairs and go to the stage left, and we'd get on this platform, and they would sort of rope us in, and this platform would rise up in the air 50 feet and go behind another set piece so that they would see, it was like an archway, and you would see the whores in this cart. So before the whores, the cart came forward, I had to get in place, play one role, stop, and on cue, play another role, march off, and that was it. Thank God. <laughs> and, and, and every time... Well, you say it with the cart before the horse. Yeah. Uh, I remember that. Uh, and uh, I, I remember, you know, I don't know if they still do, because they're having some financial trouble too now at the Met. But I remember that the two roles paid a total of $344 per show. Well, a lot of that is for putting on the costume. I said thank God for you. Well, I was thinking, yeah, $172 a roll is probably the most I ever made. But I was in the original production of Ghosts of Versailles. I had an onstage part uh, in that. And I was playing an instrument called the Dumbek, which is an hourglass uh, Mediterranean, Middle Eastern kind of drum that's either made of clay or metal, and it's got an hourglass shape and a single head, and you hold it with one hand and press the skin and play it with fingers the other way. Now, John Corleano wrote the score for Ghosts of Versailles, and he wrote a very complex Dumbek part. Now, ever since I've been able to read music fluently, I haven't been able to memorize as well. I used to memorize a lot better before I became fluent in reading. So what I had to do was take white gaffer's tape and write out the part on the tape and then keep turning the drum <laughs> so I, could, you know, I didn't have to memorize the part. And that worked well for me. I've done that. A couple of times. So I did on stage for maybe 12 productions there, Billy Budd, a Meister Singer. And it, it's just a great place to work. They have a wonderful cafeteria where you can go 
And it, it's sort of like what the old MGM cafeteria must have been. Soldiers are there with bandages and open wounds and, you know, uh, nurses and doctors and, you know, whoever's in the Playboys. Mm. That was a wonderful place to work. I actually got to play with the New York Philharmonic for one week. Would you like to hear the story? Sure. Well, every percussionist dreams about playing with the Philharmonic, especially ah. since my teachers had played with the Philharmonic. And they say that babies bring luck. Well, about three weeks before Anton was born, in 1975, it was a Monday afternoon, and... 75. Uh, 85. 1985. Did I say 75? No. 1985. Sorry. And, uh, and, and I was uh, working on some music because I was supposed to play a week of concerts with the Houston Ballet at City Center, which is great. Very rarely did I have a whole week full of work. And I was playing Saturday night up at the Paper Mill Playhouse in New Jersey, something for somebody at a musical there. So the phone rings. It's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, hello. And they said, hi, I'm calling from the New York Philharmonic. Can you play with us next week? I said, come on, who is this? <laughs> and they said, no, this is uh, you know, James Chandler's <coughs> office, and that was the right name. We, we found out we need somebody to play a whole week's worth of concerts, and one of them is a radio broadcast. So I said, yes, I'm definitely in. Uh, let, me, let me call you back in, in, in five minutes. I just want to make sure that I get rid of my other job, because you have to do that. You can't just call, if you take a job, you can't just call them back and say, I can't do it, go find somebody. You have to find somebody for them who's willing to do the job, willing to, and usually is, you respect more than you do your own plan, because uh, you, you want them to be satisfied. They, they don't like the fact that you cancel them on them, but they understood that it was the Philharmonic. Anyway, I made a couple of phone calls, and my friend Lou, who lived near the paper mill playhouse, couldn't do the Saturday night at the paper mill, but he could do the whole week at City Center. So I was covered. I just had to find somebody for paper mills. And then I called the Philharmonic back, and I said, um, I, I'm definitely going to do it. I'm going to find somebody to cover this other job. And they said, well, that's great. Here's the, here's the rehearsal times. You'll be playing snare drum. And the piece is a piece by uh, Jeanette, uh, Giuseppe Sinopoli, an Italian opera composer and uh, conductor, whose music I was a little familiar with. I knew he wrote very difficult modern music. So now it's 4.30, and uh, I start making phone calls to get rid of the Saturday night. And nobody could do it. I, I was on the phone for five hours. I called about 50 people. Now, some people didn't want to do it because it meant subbing a musical show on percussion without a rehearsal. I had already played for them two weeks before that, so I already knew the show. But somebody who was going to sub would have to go out there before the Saturday night and watch the regular person show, maybe get a copy of the music and work on it. Not everybody wanted to do it. Was, I was giving people an extra $100 just to do that. I couldn't get anybody to do it. Finally, around 10 o'clock, I got a friend of mine who just came back from a tour of Asia. And she didn't have any jobs. She said, yeah, I'll do it. And uh, uh, that got me off the hook. So now it's 10.30, and I said, holy cow, I'm playing snare drum tomorrow with the New York Philharmonic. Now, percussionists have to play a lot of different instruments. We have to play xylophone, glockenspiel, chimes, timpani, marimba, tambourine, triangle, all kinds of small stuff. And snare drum was probably my weakest instrument. So at that time, uh, my wife and I were living in an apartment on the sixth floor of a building in, in Midtown. And I had an apartment on the first floor that I used to practice music in. So I went downstairs, took out all the really hard snare drum parts that I could, and started working on them with a metronome, just warming up the hands. So after about an hour, I said, OK, I'm, I'm still ner nervous, but uh, whatever it is, I'll get through. I'll just go there early, look at the music, and that'll be fine. So I get to Avery Fisher Hall the next day, and I was so early, I was the first one there. Nobody from the orchestra had shown up yet, just the stage hands. So I said, okay, fine. Just want some water. Finally, the librarian showed up. He's usually the first one to, to show up. And he says, oh, Larry, I heard you're going to be playing with us because uh, we had gone to Juilliard together. He says, 
I don't have any music for you. Uh, we found out that they're doing this uh, uh, suite from his opera, and it's a stage band that's needed, and you're in the stage band. But he didn't send the music for the stage band. That's why we didn't know that we needed to hire you. So he's bringing it when he comes from his hotel. So great, you know, it's probably going to get there like 10 minutes before the rehearsal. Mm. So I'm trying to be calm. I'm getting a little nervous. So I go on the stage, and I look at the percussion folders to see what their parts are like. And we have a phrase for that in music, when the music is really complex. We call it wallpaper. There was just notes and notes and, and weird time signatures and rhythms and different things going on. And I just, I was getting more upset just looking at it. So finally, Buster came. He was still playing snare drum with the Philharmonic. He got me one of the Philharmonic snare drums, set me up in the wings, and people from the stage band started to come in. There was an accordionist, a clarinetist, and there was a, a bass drum uh, next to the, the snare drum. Now, the personnel manager shows up. He says, oh, Spivak, great, glad you could join us. Uh, you're 2-3. I said, okay. Anybody here know what that means? No, 2-3. Well, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Master's degree from Juilliard, I had no idea what they were talking about, and I was too scared to ask anybody. No, 2-3, that's where you was. I thought maybe two-thirds was the key, was the time signature, and each bar would be two-thirds of a triplet, I wasn't sure. Were there three snares? No, there's only one snare. Only one snare. So now, now I'm sweating. Now I'm sweating, but I'm trying to be cool. And everyone else, no one didn't seem to bother anybody else. But when you're in that kind of band, you like a conductor up there? We had an associate conductor okay. who was in the wings. Good point. And, and uh, he had a video monitor of the stage conductor, so they were able to coordinate that. I see. So I'm still waiting in the wings. Now it's like a quarter to. All right, 10 2, Giuseppe Sinopoli shows up and runs right up to his dressing room on the floor above the stage. So I don't have the music. Now it's just about 11 o'clock. We're ready to start the rehearsal. I'm saying, okay. Well, you know, you know what was a good thing? It was My wife and I were going to Lamaze class because we were, we were going to you know, try to do Anton as, as naturally as possible. So I started breathing. You know, the controlled breathing, I found it did actually calm me down. You know, I don't know if it would have been very good if I was in labor, but this seems to work okay. So then the librarian comes over and he said, we don't really have actual music for you. Read off this accordion part. I look at the accordion part and it's in three quarter time. The bass drum was one and I was two, three. Boom, chick, chick, boom, chick, chick, boom, chick. And that was the whole piece. This was a great job. The regular orchestra would be playing on stage, spring music, about 15 minutes, then they would warn us to be quiet. They would open up the door from the wings. The assistant conductor would conduct us in this like an Italian festival band. And I would play one. We'd do that twice, then they would close the wings, and we'd be done. <laughs> so it was a great job. Uh, so one night, the night of the radio broadcast, I think, we had a Lamas class, and I, I had to go late because uh, I was, I was job. And I, I go to the Lamas class, and they were so used to seeing me in sweatpants and jeans, and here I was in a black suit, and uh, so that everyone was saying, "Oh, well, you, know, where you?" And my wife just said, "He just played with the New York Philharmonic." I learned from that story, I mean, from that experience, that you should never be afraid to ask. You know, that would have—I I probably would have had more hair today if I had, <laughs> if I had thought to ask about, uh, you know, what's too free. <coughs> now, something totally unexpected happened. Uh, I guess it was ten years ago. I became an inventor, and, and I, when I say unexpected. It's because I'm the least handy person. It takes me a month to put up a shelf, you know, to change something. But here's the story. It happened because of a Broadway show. In 2003, uh, the Rogers and Hammerstein organization decided to revive Flower Drum Song on Broadway. I have the original album. The original album, <laughs> yeah. 
and uh, they thought the book needed to be doctored up. Yes. So they brought in <laughs> the playwright David Henry Wong to doctor the book, and he had made his he had gotten his Tony Award for writing the play M Butterfly. Yeah. He was early. One hit wonder. <laughs> and David, uh, while he was doctoring the book, he had a seven-year-old son. And his son wanted to take drum lessons. So he went to the drummer doing the musical and said, do you teach? And he said, no, I don't really teach. But you know who's good with kids? Larry Spivak. <laughs> yes, he has kids, and he has a studio in Midtown. So David called me up, and I knew who he was. And he said that his son was seven and wanted to take drum lessons. So I said, well, seven, that's pretty young. Why don't you tell him, instead of it being a lesson, he's just coming over to my studio to play with my stuff. And if we hit it off, we have the right chemistry, then we'll talk about lessons. So about a week later, David brought his son Noah over to my studio, which was on West 51st Street between Broadway and 8th. Can you get more Midtown than that? I don't think so. But that's the building where Anton was raised. We lived there about 25 years. Anyway, um, Noah came over, and he picked up this toy that I had, which was a clown that when you squeezed its stomach, it crashed cymbals. It was about the size of a can opener. And he, said, he loved this thing. And he said, wouldn't it be great if we could build a giant one? And I said, well, if you want to do that for our lessons, it's OK with your parents, we can do that. Dad, I won't study with Larry. So, great. We set up a lesson two weeks later. No so you where the Broadway church is now? It's, it's right down the block. It's right next to the... I live in Hell's Kitchen, so I mean, oh. we're neighbors for you. Right, right, the Lancier. Plaza, right? Yeah, yeah the right, Lancier yeah. is right there. So the, the shoemaker's still there. They're about the only one. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Everything. Vasily, Vasily. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway, so, so uh, I had forgotten all about this thing. So I said to Noah, well, what do you want to do? You want to play bongos? You want to play xylophone? You want to play tambourine? He says, no, I want to build the cymbal guy. So I looked at this toy and figured out that we needed something with a spring that we could attach things to. And I was thinking, and drummers use something called a hi hat. It's the chick of the boom chick, where the bass drum is boom chick. It's two cymbals that come down like this, sort of dryly. Well, we discovered that if you took the cymbals off the hi hat, we could build, we got actually a cymbal machine that works with a foot pedal. I'll show you a picture of it. I can oh, pass this around it. later. That was our first cymbal crashing machine, our first cymbal mm -hmm. guy. And it was made out of wood that used to be Anton's platform bed <laughs> and, and shelving brackets. And we used a regular hi-hat and two symbols that I had, and, and two little things. And uh, I said, no, I think we've invented something, because we got a loud crash with a foot pedal, which is something that nobody had done before. He said, no, 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 let's do something else. But I continued, because I thought that this thing had a future. And we brought it to a metal guy. Oh, so, so here's the next model. A little, a little better, you know, worked a little bit better. And then we brought this one to a metal guy, and he designed the current version. Now, we, what we did was, we designed this black part. The silver part is a hi-hat that every drummer has, right? And, and the cymbals that everybody has. So it's an attachment? It's an attachment. It's, it's an apparatus that goes on the hi-hat, and then you put the cymbals on, and when you press the foot pedal, these arms come together. It's actually it's so simple, I couldn't believe nobody ever thought of it before. But you know, we, we're living in a great time to be an inventor. Uh, you don't need to hire a patent attorney to do a patent search anymore. You can go to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office website and type in what you think you've invented, and they'll go to that sort of area. It's all with numbers yeah. and categories, and see if uh, you've, you've really invented something. So you don't have to pay anybody. Then. If you find out that you think you've got something original, you don't have to do the full patent. 
you can do what's called a provisional patent, which is only $100. You can make up the paperwork yourself. And what that does is it files your paperwork at a certain date. They don't open the envelope. They just hold the envelope. If there's ever a question, you can always go back and say, yes, that's the date that I, that I sent it. But what that does is it gives you a year to show it to industry people and see if you can sell it, you have it licensed. And I couldn't, I didn't find anyone who wanted to license it, but we thought that we really had something very special here. So I applied for a provisional patent, and then a year later, we converted it to a full patent application using the three of us, myself, the boy, Noah, who was then 12, and the metal guy, Glenn, as co-inventors. And uh, matter of fact, my patent attorney, who was very experienced, he said, uh, I'm gonna have to call you back because I haven't ever done a patent application with somebody who's 12. <laughs> and uh, two years later, we got a US patent for symbol guy. And I discovered that it worked very well with a remote pedal that's made by a company uh, called uh, Drum Workshop in Los Angeles. This is for drum set players who don't want, they want to have tom-toms over here, not where the hi-hat is. And the great thing about this is it has a cable, works like a bicycle brake cable, so you can actually have the cymbals six feet away from your head. And this particular model was used in the Broadway show Porgy and Bess. And as a matter of fact, every cymbal crash you hear on the cast album was done with Cymbal Guy. And we also used the Cymbal Guy in the show Nice Work if you can get it. So we had the two Gershwin shows on 46th Street uh, for about nine months. And uh, I had 20 of these made up by a shop, a metal shop in Oregon, Bend, Oregon. And we've sold all but five. So we only have five left. We have a, a red model. This one was rented by Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. for a production of 1776. This is what a U.S. patent looks like, the first wow. page. And how tall is it? Uh, it comes up to about here. So the, the symbols are where they should be, really at ear level. But I, I do admit, if you playing this here, it's, it's a little loud because it's right by your head. Yeah. When you're playing the crash symbols, you don't get the full volume of the symbols because you're above them. But when they're right next to your ear, so we started really only like renting out the, uh, the part with the cable, the ten foot cable. Have you considered showing that to the two modern art? I, mean, I did. Really, I did actually. Oh, because of a mem no. I mean, it looks like something that. Would be I good. did. Yes, uh, and I, I I thought that they would put it in their design collection. Or just maybe just as a special. Yeah, they they turned me down. They turned me down. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there it is. <laughs> One little question, with, with the extension cable on the cymbal guy, is there a time delay after you step on the pedal? Between There's the a slight delay, slight so you have to anticipate it a little right. bit. And it's not a very refined, like putting your foot down, it's, it's like a stomp and release. Oh. Because huh. the cymbals are actually, they're being thrown together. They're not being, they, they, they're, they're angled like this, slightly, when they come together, which is perfect for playing crash cymbals. Because then they get like that, and you don't get an air pocket, which sometimes you get when you play cymbals by hand. So, but you have to really jam it down to hit them. It seems like it would be a pretty simple thing if there were any demand or desire for it to make it digital these days. Step on it and it instantaneously. I guess you could, but you know, drummers are not. We like to play things with foot pedals. They and we like the feel of the cymbals, and and, uh, and and then we also. You know, when you're a synthesizer player, you get to the job and you have what I call the synthesis prayer, which is you pray that everything turns on when you throw the on switch. Mm -hmm. so you're gonna be, you know. mm. Do you have had any dissension from the union with the traditional symbol players that go like that? Not the union. No, well, but, but the, the players, like, yeah. a lot of the players said, oh, you're trying to cut out our job. Yeah, well, that was my point. Well, the guy who played Porgy and Bess, they, what they did with Porgy and Bess was, they wanted this version to be able to be you done. The most recent one. The recent one, yeah. The they wanted it to be able to be done on Broadway, uh -huh. which meant that they couldn't hire the 40 or 50 piece orchestra that Gershwin wrote for. And they only hired one percussionist to play drums, xylophone, cymbals, timpani, 
uh, African drums, uh, bongos, chimes, and they weren't going to hire a second one because they wanted to have more strings. So they had one percussionist. So I like to think of it as not uh, losing jobs, but really enhancing what one person can do. And on Broadway, they usually don't have more than one percussionist. So the only thing I could think of is for a good example, Leon, and perhaps you're physically disabled in some way, so you couldn't really stand up. It would be a good accommodation for such a disability. I guess, but you know, most most uh, cymbal players, uh, you know, okay. they okay. they don't have that disability. They, they play with their hands. Yeah, that's true. I guess you know, if you were sitting down, unless of course you broke your hand, like you. Yeah. That's probably where you first got the idea, and you didn't know it. No, no, you, I got the idea from a seven-year-old, and now he has... So now he's a multi-millionaire, <laughs> no. and he takes calls from you. We, 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 we figured out a royalty, the way the, the royalties would work, and he gets actually 25% of the inventor's royalties. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't come out to that much because we don't charge a lot for it. So I just sent him a check for twelve fifty. dollars We sold one to a high school in Virginia. Uh, the other question I had is, if I recall, you said something about he had a little, like, clown version of it, a small mm -hmm. one. Have you ever now went into costume? You could put it on the stage, for example, in a clown costume. You could do it with that, but it would be difficult. I think Noah wanted to do that at one point, but I said, no, we want, to, we want people to sort of take it a little more seriously than that. So uh, there's one other thing I wanted to tell you about the, the, the patent office. I learned a lot about the way that they classify things. I found out that this invention is classified by the way the symbols are mounted. So this family that this belongs to is rigid vibrator. <laughs> I swear, okay. you can't, that's the, it, it's like eight, music 822 point something, and that's that's the family. And uh, okay, so. We'll hold that. Something, something, no, no, oh, it's 7.30. Okay. Would you like, to, would you like to hear some, some more stories? Yes. Well, what are our, what are our options? Yes, 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 and slash but, what are our other options? Well, I want to demonstrate some of the instruments that I brought today. Maybe this would be good to do that before I uh, tell this other story. This is an instrument called the flexitone. And it's sort of uh, a handheld version of the musical saw. This is a blade of metal, and it has uh, mallets attached to it, and you play it. You probably heard that in the soundtrack to Wizard of Oz. Uh, unbeknownst to me, the composer Shostakovich wrote an opera called The Nose. Yes. And there's, there's two flexitone solos in that opera. And I was called by the American Symphony to play. Oh, it did. Fascinating instrument. It looks like the way it's modulated at the frequency range. And I, the part in the nose was so complex that I had to play it on two flexitones because it went out of the range of one. Hmm. But I found that after I could play these atonal solos, I could actually take requests for songs. Here's another neat instrument. 
And this is uh, based on a very old instrument. When I say old, I mean medieval times. A friction drum, like a lion's roar. Now this works, this is a rosined cloth. This is a wooden stick that's also been rosined. And this is a piece of a, a PVC that's sealed off, so it acts as a resonator. So you can actually play. Or you can laugh with it. Or you can play the sound of a squeaky uh, haunted house door. This is kind of a weird instrument. Question on that one? Yes. Recently I had the great experience of seeing a group from the Lincoln Center educational section come to one of my uh, meeting places in the community. And the fellow that's a group that were in South American and, and several more people from Brazil around the group, some US state people, uh, probably seven people, maybe six. And this guy had something that's reminiscent of an extraordinarily thin sphere with a little child around the ends. And he said, somebody's asked him how he played this thing. He says, well, it's a trick. I'm a percussionist. And when he just kind of skip his finger along the top of that, but he wouldn't tell us what the thing was called. And it gave a sound very reminiscent of that. So now it's a South American drum of a sort. So they sort of like squish down. Well, I'll call it a snare yeah. drum with chimes around the other side. It's, you do something like that to watch it. And he gets a noise like that. Have you any idea how you do a blood trick? Yes. It's a yeah, it's called a thumb roll. A thumb, so thing, no it's called a thumb roll. I, I mostly do it on tambourine. Well, well, it but it's a way of rolling like with that. your thumb. I didn't want to use that word. Yeah, it's he used his middle finger, but I suppose But you can get that same roll. effect with. Does it have a name other than the Yes, thing? thumb roll. Thumb roll. It's a thumb roll. Even though he is a sister. Yeah. This is a Super Bowl on a bobby pin. <laughs> Let me split a little light share. Okay. they're laminated for. I see that you're the picture of that, but his sound is more like that other uh, item you were putting. Well, sorry. Anyway, this uh, is a wrong. Thank you. Okay. These, uh, maybe you remember these from Monty Python, the movie? These are coconut halves. And when I was at Brooklyn College, they had a, a shop that did the uh, stage sense. So I drained the coconut. You have to drain it first. We brought it to the guy with the saw, and he ran it through so that I got a nice straight edge. And this is how you get clip clop. Now there are a couple of famous clip clop parts in the uh, orchestral literature. Does anybody know any? Well, there's one in Sleigh Ride. And Surrey with the French on top? Is that yes. I've sometimes had to play the spoons, which is a uh, maybe 150 year old kind of way of playing music. And it's not that hard, really. You know, there are several spoon playing websites. I, I can believe it. They have little conventions. So they do I can believe it. So I'll, I'll show you. I'll let you in on a little secret. If you want to learn how to play. You hold it so that the ends of the spoons are touching, and then put your finger down just so that they're separated by about a half an inch. And then, take a lot of practice. I'll give you credit for that. Do something like a screw with two uh, butterfly things and a string in the middle of it. I've seen that. Mm -hmm. I've seen that. Okay. Uh, this is a duck call. It's a good idea. Siren whistle. Can you speak with duck caller to sound like Donald Duck? Well, Donald Duck doesn't really sound like a duck call. 
I mean, if you, if you speak it, it's a space So, it's, you know, it's more like the, uh, the sound of the, the Charlie Brown uh, yeah. the, the teacher the sound. And this is, this is a slide whistle, also called a swanny whistle. And you probably heard that on Wheel of Fortune. When they get bank, you know, bankrupt. <laughs> they probably do it you know, with the recording. But you can actually play the melodies using this. And sometimes you're playing the show, they want you to do something like... Well, it's played, it, it is a woodwind instrument technically, but it's played by a percussionist. Okay? The woodwind players only play piccolo, flute, uh, oboe, English horn, oboe d'amour. Uh, yeah, whatever, yeah. Yeah. The classic. The classic, classic. things. Yeah. So the they don't actually do a lot of this stuff. As a percussionist, do you have to bring all of these instruments, or whichever instruments are in the piece with you? Or well, that's a good question. It, it varies. Um, when you do a... Uh, a Broadway show, if you're the, it's your job, you have the option usually of renting them your equipment for the run of the show. And you would supply it, and you would get either a weekly or a monthly fee. But if you're doing a concert, say, in Carnegie Hall, usually they'll rent the instruments, the big instruments, from a rental company. And then if, if they, you would bring like a tambourine or a triangle. Usually, my, my rule of thumb is, I have a small case, and if I have to bring more than that, then I charge for it. But I also have a big case, which is um, the, the biggest size suitcase you can get that will fit under subway turnstiles. <laughs> I measure it. There's, there's about a quarter inch clearance. And uh, I fill that up all the time and bring that, bring that to jobs. But uh, one of the things that I had to deal with being an apartment dweller, uh, I lost the apartment on uh, 51st Street where I used to have all my instruments. So now I have to have a monthly room at Manhattan Mini Storage. I use the one that's right by the Intrepid on Levitt Avenue. And I have a 91 square foot room. It's 13 by 7, and it's completely filled. Completely filled. And I keep acquiring new stuff. You know, if I see something that you know I need or somebody, you know, invariably, you know, you buy all the equipment. And I have a xylophone, two different sets of key and bars, I have vibraphone, I have marimba, I have timpani. I have chimes, I have a gong, I have a concert bass drum, I have coca drums, bongo drums, snare drums, drum kit, lots of cymbals. Well, they'll call you up and say, uh, you know, well, you know, we need you to play something else. And now there's so many experimental new kinds of drums, it's really wonderful, but uh, it can be you know, very expensive. And the, the storage room is almost like having another apartment. It's almost $500 a month. And then also if I... I had to make a special trip there tonight because I wanted to bring these little tchotchkes to show you. Because it's, uh, you know, just to show you that not everything is, you know, all classic. It's cheaper going down on the Lovett Avenue with that red and yellow building. Is it 24 hours? Yep. And they're really Do nice. Do they have a lotus shop? Yep. What's your, what's your name? Chelsea. They've got red and yellow yeah. building on yeah. the Lovett Avenue. Uh -huh. Check them out. I will. And tell them you're with Manhattan Mini because they're going to make people look better. Yeah, that's true. There's moisture, it's filling tubes, right? I mean, you have, I mean, you have, I assume you have a car. Do you have a lot of tubes? Well, where are you, are, are you still in, like, Hell's Kitchen, West? West no, well, we live on 190th Street. Oh, that's nice. Well, I used to work in an office that was not far from here, on 38th and 8th. Uh -huh. And normally they would need stuff, I would have to get it from there, right. so I'd try to get one closer there. Yeah, I know. And it's then they closed up. Right. But uh, anyway, that's, that's a consideration. Well, you ready for a good story? One uh, yes. question. I was talking to, well, the Klezmatics recently, and things that you've done here tonight show would demonstrate what you might call tonal envelopes, and I would juxtapose, say, the oboe versus the clarinet. Now, we talked about soprano, alto, sorry, my old class snacks, and soprano, and soprano, uh, alto, and tenor. Musicians or as within a, an orchestra or a band. The tonal qualities most people say between an oboe and a clarinet are somewhat different than the envelope 
that they live in. So, like, if you get two in the same range, do they ever fight it out? Maybe two, two well, instruments Well, like, that kind of fighting back and forth with an oboe would make an interesting musical uh, party within an orchestra. So, I mean, has that ever been written for? Do musicians sometimes just do that for the heck of it? And then if you say having an oboe stuck in the middle of a song. You're asking that, about composing. Well, Which is be. my other, yeah, the other half of my life. Resume, yeah. yeah um, I'm also a composer. Yeah. I've been writing music since 1971, and uh, I have written music for films, uh, for television, for the theater, and uh, Anton and I are writing a musical together. It's called Amber Crystal. Would you like to hear a song from it? Yeah. Sure, sure, I would. So set it up. Okay. This. The musical Amber Crystal takes place in, a, in an alternate realm in the kingdom of Zeke. Now what happens is that the, the princess of Zeke isn't allowed to marry until her brother does, and her brother is he's not considered very charming, shall we say. He's, he keeps to himself, he, he smears pictures with ashes, they call him Ashy because he's always hanging around the fireplace. And so the king of Zeke does not think that Ashi would be a great ruler. And then the prince of a neighboring kingdom, Calvert, shows up. And Calvert's, well, this is his big introduction song. To those who look up to me, I mind not when you applaud. But if you truly knew me, as this proud facade I'm aware that I've been rumored to possess tremendous might and this notion has me humored for it only is half right because I am just a regular guy Advantage of me. How do you sleep at night? 
You suppose I'm too unkind For putting you in such a bind That's just the way I am inclined For I possess a business mind I've made a few arrangements To those who made me face estrangements they all had tales to make you sob In circumstances dire They've come to me for hire I'm just doing my job But what I do seems awful Why should it be unlawful? I won't lie or cheat or rob So call me unforgiving It's how I make a living I'm just doing my job Many have need of my talents they're not in the spot to refuse But the scales of exchange have to balance Nothing's free, all I ask for my dues I'm charging quite a coffer For just the sort of offer You won't get from any other hob My hats may be outrageous But still I earn my wages I'm just doing my job My skills are so demanded So much me can't be handed to the rules of trinkets that they fought. So then I'm not a pal, you bet I know my value. I'm just doing my job. My work may be forbidden, so I keep it hidden. My hands are very quick to swab. You know you can't reveal it, so take it as I deal it. I'm just doing my job. Some might consider me ruthless. story about the fake book, about how writing out music. So I've also been copying out music in my own hand for a long time. I didn't really enjoy doing it on the computer. So now I use I use a pen, a couple of pens and a ruler and print it up myself. It is a lost art. It, uh, everybody's using computers now. Friend of mine, the father of the music transcriber. Did you teach yourself how to do No, actually, um, when I started composing, you have to uh, copy out parts for the players. You, know, you make up a score which has all the parts, and then you have to copy out individual parts. And to learn how to do that, I mean, I had to do that because I couldn't afford a copyist. So gradually I got better and better at it. And, and I've been doing that since 1973. I have the same pen. Yeah, that's a good answer, but it didn't really answer the question in my mind. If you were composing, say, and you just come up with a new melody, you have it in your head. It's very easy, I find, to certainly write out the notes, but then you've got to sit and do the rhythm. You're a perfectionist, so I guess you've got it over on top of people. It's a rhythm. Good. Rhythm is not a problem for me. I do a lot of transcribing for people. Well, after practice makes perfect. Yeah. I got very lucky last year. Uh, I got a call to do a commission, and it was wonderful. It was a, an old friend of mine, and he said, "Look, we wanna we wanna hire you to write the piece. Come down to Tennessee to perform it, and uh, we have this much money. Can you do it?" And I said, "Yes." He said, "Good. Start working on it." And this January, my wife and I flew down to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and we premiered this piece at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Now, Oak Ridge is the big nuclear uh, research center. And 
So my friend said, he said, uh, we want it to be a quartet for violin, cello, and two percussionists. This is why I play violin and the good cellist. And I would play one of the percussion parts and he would play the other. And he said, but we want the piece to honor the spallation neutron source. The spallation neutron source. It's a point of And that's a new accelerator that they built in Oak Ridge last year. So he said, can you, can you find out you know, how to express that in music? And I said, sure. So I went to the website and how it works, and I couldn't understand the thing. And I mean, it's been a long time since I had physics. Now, my wife just really, well, she wanted to keep a set of world book encyclopedia. A world book. That's for 10 year olds writing reports for school. So I looked up Adam. And he said, oh, Adams are very small. <laughs> so, and, and that, basically, I got to understand True. it so that I could do it musically. Now, that piece is going to be presented next May at uh, the Nimoy at Symphony Space. The group from, is coming up from Oak Ridge to do it here. And we're also going to do another piece that they've commissioned me, or co commissioned me to write, with an electric guitarist. It's going to be an electric quintet for electric violin, electric cello, electric guitar, and two electronic percussionists. And it's called High Flux Isotope Reactor. We'll also do that at Symphony Space. <laughs> this Monday, this Monday I'm going to rec be recording a, another commission I got this year called Gans Mysterioso. This one also has a kind of a strange story. Uh, in 1926, when Puccini wrote his opera Turandot, he scored it for 13 tuned gongs. They tuned, it's an octave plus an extra note in bass clef, A to A. Those 12 tones plus one more, 13 tuned pitches. And this was used, he commissioned, uh, Puccini commissioned a, an Italian cymbal company to make up this first set. And then it got lost. Nobody knew where it was. A New York percussionist, colleague of mine, was looking in an opera warehouse and he found a crate with the guys, with that particular set, and convinced the owner to sell it to him. And this was his pride and joy, because every time they did Turandot, he could, he could play it. Matter of fact, he did it on with uh, Pavarotti, and Pavarotti signed one of the noms. Anyway, this percussionist passed away five years ago, and his wife wanted, wants to sell the gongs. So she's going to create a website, and she commissioned me to write a short piece featuring the gongs that is going to be the centerpiece of the website. So I wrote the piece, when, when I say short, I mean 100 seconds, a minute 20 seconds, for gongs, bass flute, which is like the regular flute except it's bigger, so it plays an octave lower, and cello. And we're going to record that on Monday at her home in Hastings, New York. So I, I, it's been great. It's the second commission I got this year, and, and it doesn't always happen like that. But let me tell you, let me tell you a quick story. Um, has anybody heard of the show Sweet Charity? Sweet Charity, great musical, score by Cy Coleman, book by uh, Neil Simon, uh, lyrics by uh, Dorothy Fields. Well, the show, that, the show was originally in the late 60s. It was actually one of the first musicals to use rock music. Uh, Cy Coleman was very proud of saying. Anyway, the show uh, was on Broadway in 1987. Uh, Debbie Allen was the star of it. Okay, well, no, she's no Gwen Bird. She, no, she's no Gwen Bird. <laughs> but the star of that show is really Bob Fosse's choreography, which is, which is great. It's just unbelievable. Anyway, the show was playing on Broadway, and they were planning on closing. So I got a call from a contractor who was booking a national tour of it. And he said, would you like to go out on the national tour? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. But at this time, Anton was two, and I said, uh, but I would want to, going out for six months, I'd like to take my wife and my son with me. So he said, well, let me call the company manager, and I'll let you know if that's okay. So he did. He called me back. He said, yeah. He said, we want you. You can take the wife and your son, and I can even work out a deal where you rent them your percussion instruments, which was great, because I was making another $500 a week from that, just from that alone. So then he said, so he read me the list the instruments. And I said, well, I don't have a bass drum, but I'll, I'll get one. I'll buy one. And he said, well, i got to ask you, what are you going to use for the anvil? There's a number called the Fru, and there's this real clang whenever they box in there. So I said, well, I have an automobile brake drum that sounds pretty good. He says, no, no, no. 
you got to go to Joe, the guy who was playing the show on Broadway, and buy the exact one that he's using on Broadway after the show closes. I don't care what it costs, you got to get that one. I said, why? He probably paid $2 for it. He said, that's not the point. He said, Fosse's very particular. And if he's in a bad mood, you're going to hit this thing, he's not going to like it, and we'll be in Toronto trying to find a junkyard where you can buy one that he likes. And the first rehearsal in Toronto was a month later, and that's exactly what happened. Fosse was there, saw Coleman, Winberg, and the minute I hit this thing, stop! Fosse gets up and starts screaming. Well, what, what's the matter with that angle? It sounds terrible! <laughs> and I could hear the guy just saying, oh, Bob, that's the one I used on the wall. He says, well, get a different hammer! So I had a steel hammer, and I only had the one hammer with me, because so I didn't think to pack two that he was going to ask for. So I, I remembered a trick that Arnie taught me. I said, okay, and I dropped the hammer in my bed. <laughs> For a couple of minutes, we reached up and said, well, let me try this one. So, and I just hit it twice as hard, and it was fine, except for the poor trombonist who was sitting in front of it. Anyway, we finished the two, two months in Toronto. It was wonderful. Uh, then we went to Philadelphia, and we were there for three weeks. And the third week we were there, uh, the first show that week was a Tuesday. So my wife and I said, well, let's, we got the whole day off. Let's put Anton in the stroller, and let's walk down and see who has the best cheesesteak, Gino's or Pat's. It was kind of like a competition there, like they had the stage deli and the Carnegie deli. So we walked Anton down, we strolled him down, we had cheesesteaks, he fell asleep, we had some beers, we went to an antique store, we went to a playground, got back to the hotel about 4 o'clock, and the concierge says, Oh, Mr. Spivak, there's about 40 messages for you, you have to call your conductor right away. So I got up to the room and the phone was ringing. It was my conductor. He said, where have you been? I said, I don't work during the day. He said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Al, the drummer for the show, see, I was the percussionist. Al, the drummer for the show, was in the hospital. He had a cyst under his arm, which had gotten inflamed, and he was in the hospital. And this poor guy had been on the phone all day trying to find somebody who would play the show on drums, because the Fosse show was very complicated. There were a lot of different movements that have different sounds with them. So I said, well, do you want me to play drums? He said, no, 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 I, I got a guy, he's supposed to be a great sight reader, and he's going to play drums, you play percussion. But can you come down to the theater and rehearse with him? So I said, oh, of course. So I took a quick shower, took a cab down to the theater. I get to the uh, pit, and there's this guy, he's about maybe 20 years older than me, and he's sitting there behind the drum set just looking at the book, like, how am I going to do this? So I, I introduced myself, we started talking, I said, are you more comfortable playing drums or percussion? He said, percussion, I'm not a drummer. I just said that I would do this. So I said, all right, you play percussion, I'll play drums, I'll, I'll tell the conductor what's going on. He said, oh, thanks, that, that's, that really makes me feel better. So he got out of the drum set, I climbed in. Luckily, I was about the same size as Al. And I noticed that he had things set up differently than I would. He had tom-toms over here and a cowbell attached to the hi-hat. I wouldn't put it there, but I wasn't about to start changing his equipment around. So now I'm thinking, oh my God, what have I gathered myself into? Uh, you know, this is a Fosse show. I've never played it on drums. Even though I've been sitting next to the guy for two months, you know, it's still not the same as playing it. But I remembered something that a very conceited New York drummer told me before I subbed for him. Just keep it simple. Don't play fancy. Keep good time. Remember, you're not me. And that actually helped. Because <laughs> I didn't play fancy, I just tried to keep a good time. And it was a lot of fun, because the show starts off with drums. It actually starts off with a real high trumpet going... <laughs> so it's a very, real, real great drumming show. And I actually had fun, because you don't have to worry about hitting the right notes. You know, you can really play kind of freely. Intermission, dance captain came down, and she said, you know, you missed this fill in the fruit. Well, it was on a page turn, so I, I, didn't, I, I got it since then. And she said, but we really like the way you switched the hi-hat, so when Al gets out of the hospital, can you show him how to do that? <laughs> so I said, yeah, sure. So I, I finished up the week in Philly, and then we moved to Washington, D.C., National Theater. And I was still playing drums. Al was still in the hospital. While he was in the hospital, his car got stolen. The guy had no luck. So every time we got to a new city, the five people that were traveling with the show in the band would rehearse with musicians from that local town. So we had a rehearsal with the Washington musicians. We were doing that. And at the end of that rehearsal, we were going to have a full dress rehearsal. 
on stage. But Gwen Verdon, uh, Bob Fosse's ex-wife, and a wonderful Broadway performer and dancer, came and, and she took me by the hand and she said, I want to introduce you to Bob. And she brought me back to the back of the theater, and in the back couple rows was Bob Fosse, a hero. He, he stood up, he took my hand, and his hand was really cold and clammy. <laughs> he said, hey kid, we're proud of you. We heard you did real good in Philadelphia. I said, wow, complimenting Bob Fosse. I'm never going to wash this hand again. <laughs> so now we set up, we're doing the dress rehearsal, and we get about three quarters of the way through the first act, and there's a number well, if my friends could see me now. You've heard that number? Yeah. Now, there's a dance section in that, that Charity, who's the character, and it was played by Donna McKechnie in our company, the original Cassie from Chorus Line. And she does this number with a hat and cane, right? And there's this one spot where it's kind of burlesque-like. She turns her back to the audience, she shakes her touch back and forth five times, and you play on a cowbell. Well, I played it, and it had been fine every, every, every show in Philadelphia. Suddenly, Fosse stands up and starts screaming. What's the matter with that cowbell? We gotta fix that cowbell! I realized they were talking about me. So, he didn't say faster, slower, louder, softer. I just figured, oh, I gotta play it twice. So I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, let me do it again. Let me know the chat. So they reset the entire scene with lights, with props, and everything. So I'm going to sock the cowboy in the song for sure. No, 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 it sounds terrible. What are we going to do? we got to fix the cowboy. Now the conductor started to panic. So I said to him, you know, it's not my drum set. I'm filling in for the guy. He has the cowbell over here. So now the conductor thinks he's doing me a favor. He turns around to Foss and says, oh, we don't have the right equipment. Oh, that's all they have here. Well, God damn it, why not? This is a million dollar show. Why do we have the right equipment? <laughs> now, the way Sweet Charity is staged, the opening scene takes place at the edge of the Central Park Reservoir. And Charity has cashed out her bank accounts and has the money in her bag because she's going to meet this guy and they're going to get married together. So he grabs the bag and pushes her in the reservoir. So the way what happens is she gets pushed into the orchestra pit they have a huge wooden box there that's lined with foam, and, it's, and a, uh, a uh, stagehand who's hiding in the pit takes a bucket of water and tosses it up on stage, so it looks like she fell. But because they had this big box in half the pit, the strings had to play in the room and have their sound brought in on microphones. And the keyboard, the synthesizer player was up there with them. So they said, well, why don't we, so Fosse said, well, let's give, let's give the damn cowbell to the, the conductor. So I said, fine. So stagehand comes by, they unscrew the cowbell, I hand him a pair of sticks. He runs up to this room on the fourth floor that they've got the video cables from. And I'm thinking, well, if this guy gets it right, it's going to be really embarrassing for me, but at least we move on with the show. So we get to that part. Da, 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 and I hear, no, no, that's worse. Give it back to the goddamn drummer. <laughs> now, the guy who was, who was the, this is just an aside, he was the assistant conductor the synthesizer player is now the conductor of something rotten on Broadway. So he can corroborate this story and tell you that every word of it is true. Anyway, they give me back the cowbell, and I try every permutation of five notes. Dick a dick a dum, dick a dick a dum, dick a dick a dick a dick a dum, dick a dum. He's not telling me that. We worked on this thing for 20 minutes. A cowbell. Finally, thank God, the stage manager stands up and says, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're out of rehearsal time. Half hours at 5.30, because it was an opening night. And I'm like this. There's people, everybody in the theater, from the, from the wardrobe people to the, you know, the ushers, everybody was just waiting for me to get work. And my friend Tony, the trumpet player, was traveling with us. He said, ah, oh, don't worry, you'll get it right. You'll get it right, you'll be fine. But I was like nervous. Right? All I could think of was going to the opening night party and having a couple of drinks. That's all I wanted. And it was nice, because my wife had gotten a, a, a dancer friend of hers who would move to D.C., to come over and watch Anton so that she could get out for a night. So we were really looking forward to that. And I was really looking forward to having a nice hard drink <laughs> afterwards. So we start the show. All right, we get to that number. Of course, they're not going to stop. 
but I was scared. So at intermission, I waited by the pit just to see what would happen. Would, would, I mean, they couldn't really fire me from the shell because I wasn't on the instrument, but it was still... <laughs> but nobody came down. It was still work. I must have got the cowbell right. So now, the second act. They have all these great numbers. I'm a brass band. I love to cry at weddings. It's a, it's a wonderful show. If you haven't seen it, it it's just great. Uh, Dad, I have to warn you, but the, the bed, I think the, the, the mic the camera stopped recording a while ago. Should I turn it back on? If you want. It says insufficient battery. Okay. Can I borrow, borrow a phone? I'm sorry. So I'm a nervous wreck. I'm a nervous wreck. Well, I, I wouldn't have a say what you have a cup of coffee. I know, so, so we did the first act. I got a little confused there. So now the second act, I played through it. I'm really having a great time. I have a great, I mean, cymbal crashes and drum fills and playing fancier than I usually do, just because I was so happy. So the show's over. All right. We're going to go to the party. So I figured, uh, let me go up on stage and you know, tell the people in the cast. Oh, oh, I guess I got the cowbell out. So I walk up to the stage, and all the people on stage are hugging each other and sobbing yeah. and crying. I said, what's the matter? Bob Fosse died tonight. <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah, he had a heart attack crossing the street after the rehearsal and died. And they didn't tell anybody because they didn't want to oh my do the gosh. opening night. He died in Philly. He killed Bob Fosse. So, <laughs> so I... This, I remember hearing you died. This you was, realize, you were know, lucky. This I was really stressed. You should have thought it was a mess. This was before I came to this thing. Yeah. But was well, he even was upset? Up this here. was before cell phones. So I <laughs> found a quarter in my pocket. Went to a phone and called my wife at the hotel. I said, you're not going to believe I mean, it hadn't been on the news yet because we opened the show at 6 o'clock. So it hadn't been on the 10 o'clock or the 11 o'clock news. So I said, ah, honey, you're not going to believe this. She said, what's the matter? You sound terrible. I said, I, I don't know how it happened. I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. She, she, what's the matter? She said, "I killed Bob Fosse." <laughs> and I explained to her what had happened. And then she said, "I'll never forget it." What does that mean? There's no party. She <laughs> <laughs> sounds like me. <laughs> now that sounds callous. No, now, no, no, but we had to know because she had to get in a cab, and you know, we had to get dressed up, and her friend was coming. So, so I, I said, no, they're not going to have a party. These are dancers who have worked with them for 20 years. Just then, some of the dancers came by, and they had their silk shirts and leather pants on. And I said, well, what's happened? Said, well, Bob would have wanted to have a party. He would have wanted us to get real drunk in his honor. So I said, yep, come on downtown. And they had the party in the old Evett Grill, right around the corner from the National Theater. But it was this, the strangest opening night party that I've ever been to. I had... Before my wife arrived, I had about 10 salty dogs, which is vodka and grapefruit juice. So I was not... You were feeling them. I was, I was not doing it, but I, I was going up to Cy Coleman and saying, I'm sorry I killed your collaborator. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was, but the dancers were great. They said, Larry, it's not your fault that he, he spent his smoking. whole life... He smoke, right? Smoking, drinking, drugs, he was very ups, intense. downs, uh, you know, Philandering, uh, you know, uh, uh, amphetamines. And they said, we're just, we're just so proud of you for saving the day in Philadelphia. And that they were genuine. And I felt better about that. But the contractor didn't call me for another show for 10 years. <laughs> Finally, in 1998, he called me for a show called Triumph of Love to be the percussionist, drummer, and associate conductor. So I guess I was sort of forgiven. <laughs> and then I saw that Chicago was revived and ran a long time. And the Fosse, the musical, came back. And there were enough people who had done this choreography to keep it alive. So even though I killed the man, <laughs> this choreography the legend, the legend lives on. The legend lives on. So I guess the way to end this story is. Ask not for whom the cowbell tolls. <laughs> it tolls for thee. Anyway, that's my Bob Fosse story. Oh, great. Uh, I have a, a Jilly Stein story. Um, I, my career was in cameras and film, and I used to get as a customer the widow of Jilly Stein. Her name was Margaret. And she not only liked my puns, she'd shoot them right back to me. Very few people at work did that. So we were really on the same level. 
And one day she left off some film, and I went home and looked up a movie source book about video, I'm sorry, movie musicals. And then next time I saw her, I said, I looked up at some of your husband's most beloved creations were con jobs on the American public. Of course she got that. His collaborator. <laughs> Sammy Con. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Now, if I had a drum set, I'd have to give you a punch <laughs> after that. I could give you one. I, I could. Uh, I could open up the open up for questions now, if you like. I have something that if I don't say it, I won't sleep tonight. It's one of those frustrating things. You had mentioned, and this goes back a while. The story before the story before the story before, or maybe the one before the last one, or the one before that, or somewhere, or something, or somewhat, whatever. Um. There isn't something about this thing with nuclear physics and perhaps some consternation about having to deal with the size of the atom. And I remember somebody said something about difficulties with government. And uh, it all goes back to the problem of nuclear physics. Now, I'm trying to remember talking about cover items, whether it was the vanilla fudge or the velvet underground, both bands from way back, like when you said, rock and roll music, I said, I'm seeing I'm getting into depth of territories here. So I'm thinking of that. I'm not a cop to get involved with ASCAP and all, because it's a popular song done by a well-known group with well-known composers who didn't originally write the thing. But it goes da 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 Now, on my instrument playing it in the key that uh, we used to sing it in place kind of voices, you would start at E on the B string and slide up. To, excuse me, E on the beam string and slide up to the beam with this nice slow, sort of like the sides, but a constant tone of modulation rather than a sort of a vibration, vibrato. So that would be an addition to that. The other one, and it's not tell Star, and I've been sitting here again frustrated thinking I would sleep tonight until I think of the name of it. But it was from that era, and I can't think of the name of the. Uh, Composer. But again, it starts at the E on the E string bass. You go da 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 uh, so that would be interesting to add to that because I really like the guitar. I mean, now I'll sleep tonight, except I can't remember who did the da da da. Could have come to me. Any so other questions? How come you don't have death? I mean, you hear really well. How come? Well, I, I have well, lost the question. Uh, how come I'm not deaf? Well, I, I carry around earplugs with me, and if I feel like it hurts, I put the earplugs in. But I prefer to play without them because it lose a lot of the, the sensitivity. I have lost a lot of my upper uh, partials over the years. I'm oh, 61. You hear us really well. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's you know I'm. I'm I've learned how to be a good listener. Most musicians listen better than most other people because they're, it's, it's part of their uh, work requirements. They have, they have to be able to listen. And some people are, are very bad listeners. But, but musicians, I think, I, I've heard that people like to get ex-musicians to work for them because they listen, they always show up early, and they've developed uh, you know, other, other disciplines which serve them well in the business world, such as working well in the team. Because you, you, if you play jazz or rock, you you know that you're if you're in a quintet, you know that you're one fifth of the band. And if you put in more than one fifth, you're not letting, you're going to take a part that somebody else should be putting in. And when everybody's putting in that magic fifth. It just, it, it, it's, it's wonderful. And when you're in an orchestra, it's 80 people. And you play a big cymbal crash on the top of an orchestral crescendo. That's my absolute favorite thing in the world. Better than sex. Believe me. Any other questions? You didn't hear that answer. 
Does anybody else have a question? Not a question, but you two make a very good team. You and Anton. Thank you. I have a big question. You probably have never been to the Monday Night Jazz dance by the Jazz Foundation at our local 802. I haven't been to Monday Night. No, no, but it's advertised widely. Well, I got hooked over into going it before I had used to be in Boston local when I lived there many, many years ago. And I decided, well, I guess it's time I should go over and renew my friendship. So, uh, so I went the first time I signed up on the sheet. And I put down, this is an old traditional song, so I don't get any licensing problems. Going back hundreds of years. So that didn't go too badly. I can tell you what it is, but that's not good. But the second Monday I went, I said, oh, here's another traditional song that won't have a problem with licensing. It's an old traditional song. From the religious backgrounds, they must know this song. Everybody knows this song that I know of, except there's a few people who probably don't know it somewhere. So I said, you know, Here's the song, and say, yeah, we know the song. I said, okay, let's see. Let's try it in what's a good key for me, either D or C. You know, give me a note, and I'll see how it fits with my voice tonight. So we did that. Then I made the mistake. I said, four, four time, just about like this. Give me a one, four, five progression. So I presume you would know what that means. I presume then that they were trained musicians. This is jazz musicians. We start out, they didn't know what to say. I'm going this traditional song giving it sort of a scat jazz vocal treatment because they said they wanted jazz. I'm a folk singer. I do rock because you can make a living at it, but the history of folk music going back to time and boring. So they couldn't do it. It was the most embarrassing thing. So I ask you, as a peer colleague member of Edo, who I'm also in uh, Union 1000, that traveling USA line group of yeah. folk musician people, and so people would be like, you know, better. Um, why they couldn't do a one four five progression? You know, I thought like D. What are you gonna do? D G A that sort of thing. You know, what Gibbs? This is the union. Well, all the guys that the guys that, the the guys that played the Monday night uh, jam sessions are primarily jazz people. Uh huh. And when you say one four five progression, that's primarily a rock terminology. I found it for the classical genre. We're simply talking about the. You asked me what. Okay, I'm explaining well, it. it that way. Okay, it's not their. It's, it's not their. You know that it's not their language. It's not I'm their language. Sure. But if you had said, "I want a 12-bar blues," they would have known exactly what you meant. That's what I did the week before. But I don't think of blues as really jazz. It's sort of outside as a precursor to jazz, historically speaking. I mean, Larry, I'm just a question. Sorry. Actually, I don't really have a question. Um, what's, what are you working on now? Uh, it sounds like you're working with Anton. Well, we're, I'm working with Anton, so I've been, I'm in a, a very good period now. I've been writing a little music for Amber Crystal every day. We have a complete draft of the first act, 14 songs, and each one is a show, a show to me. It's they're not like the, a lot of the musicals are today. They're, they're, they're tunes, they're songs, they're not, they don't start at one place and end in another place. They're, they're A, A, B, A, or 32 bars. And we have a great opening for the second act. So I'm working on that. I'm working on um, this uh, high flux isotope reactor. Uh, so I, I go to the electric guitarist's house in Brooklyn once a week, and we throw out ideas. And it's interesting, because I write them down on paper, standard notation. And he has his guitar, so he puts them into GarageBand. So we have an audio version and a written version. And that piece we have now, we just finished the draft of the first movement uh, two days ago. And now we're going to start on the second movement. The whole piece will probably be about 12 minutes. But I'm working on that. I've been working on this Dom piece to try to get that uh, organized. And uh, the other work that I'm doing, uh, maybe not writing, uh, I've been a sub at Phantom of the Opera for 25 and a half years. Uh, I've played percussion over there. It's mostly cymbal crash. That's what, what the book is. But I think I'm some sort of record holder <laughs> for the uh, you know, third longest running substitute in Broadway history. Wow. The other two guys that started before me are the first two positions. But I'll take third. Uh, I'm not sure I have a question about that piece, though. Uh, 
you you are you have need to portray the gamma rays in a musical manner somehow high energy uh so gamma rays what, what do you mean yeah you mean spallation content um, isn't that a ga gamma ray reaction uh, that, that causes the neutrons to, to leave well, the atom? Well, no, well, I can now I can explain what spallation is doing. Do you want to know what it is? It's a process for harvesting neutrons and collecting them so that they can be used in scientific experiments. And neutrons are very valuable for experiments because they're not positive or negative. So they're not electrically charged. Now the way that it works is, they have something called an ion source, and it creates a hydrogen ion. The hydrogen ion has one proton, but two electrons, unlike the regular hydrogen atom. So it's, it's negatively charged. Now, they are put in this accelerator and stripped of the electrons, it's something called a foil. So now you've just got the proton from the hydrogen atom. So they bunch them together, and accelerate them. So now they're these really charged, fast-moving, high-energy bunches of positive energy, which are forced to collide with the target, which is liquid mercury. When these protons hit the target, neutrons are spalled off. Like, like they, they get spalled off. And that process is called spallation. Unless they have the name, the spallation neutron source. Now, if you want to know how I musicalized it, I made the, the first movement the procession of the hydrogen ion. <laughs> All the Palmer series are good. No, the procession of the hydrogen ion, which was bittersweet, sort of a march to the scaffold, because it knows it's going to be broken up in the name of science. And the way that I did the science was the, the proton uh, was uh, the violin melody, and I was playing vibraphone. So the two electrons were two notes on the vibraphone played at the same time. So the violin would play an extended melody, then there would be a melody that the, pro that the vibraphone would play, and then the two would go together in counterpoint to show how the, uh, the ion was put together. The second movement was the stripping off of the electrons and the uh, pulsating together of the protons, and the third movement was the collision with the liquid mercury. And the way that we signified that musically was we took a concert bass drum, 36-inch bass drum, this, and put it horizontal instead of vertical, took off one of the heads, filled it with 200 BBs and 150 glass marbles, put the head back on, and we had it on legs. So that all the guy had to do was hit it once with a big beater, and this would, you know, it was like a, a sound that lasted for about 12 seconds. And, uh, it was fun until we had to like clean it out of his bass drum. <laughs> so now when they do it in New York, uh, they're going to use my bass drum. So uh, they will be getting even with me. But anyway, that was that was great. And, and I'll tell you another you know, kind of silly thing was uh, they told me that they were going to live stream it from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. They have an auditorium there and cameras, and they, so anyone who had the link could watch the live streaming. So I sent it to hundreds of people, and. I found out afterwards that they didn't have sound for, for the first two thirds of it. So in this lab, they know how to split an atom, but they can't throw a switch. <laughs> the right time. Kind of Any other questions? Um, I, I work in words. You're talking about writing music. How much, how much music is a good day's writing? This I do on the train. So do I have a long subway ride on the A train? Larry, how long would those two sheets take to perform? Is that 15 seconds? Is this no, no, no. This would be about this would be about a minute and a half, maybe. Is that the music only or the lyrics? Too? It's the it's the, it's fake book style. It's the music, lyrics, and chord symbols. So when you're at a sign, you're both the lyricist and the no Anton is the lyricist. Oh, 
Air Tom is doing the lyrics and the book. Yeah, that's right. I didn't mention that before. I said we're working on the show together, but he's doing the book and the lyrics, and I'm doing the music. I just was it was confusing when he showed the sheet. Is it four seats? So I'm sorry. Writing the lyrics and then writing the melody are all of that. It's just a little confusing the way he presented it. Oh, okay. Well, sorry about that. I didn't mean to confuse you. Is it four seat songs in one act a lot? No, that's what most musicals have. Most Broadway shows. Well, maybe encouraging. Back in the day, Flower Brooks. Well, they had, they'd actually they had more because the shows were almost three hours then. Yeah, but they had more people talking. So they had more dialogue. Yeah, yeah. they had yeah. prizes. But I'm talking about like 14 separate. Um, yeah, that's usually, that's usually the case. They, they number the songs in the Broadway show, usually 1 through 14 in the first act, and 15 through 28 in the second act. And don't forget, 1 and 15 are the overture and entrees. So those, those count as musical numbers. Uh, um, it is it is nine thirty. I believe we need to leave the room in the next uh, minute. Um, sorry, very good. Um, anything else you'd like to leave? Yes, I really enjoyed the chance to tell you a little bit about myself, and uh, thank you, Anton, for inviting me. And one of the reasons I enjoyed it is that uh, in two thousand two, I wrote a one man show called "Tune of the Unknown Soloist," and I did a lot of the pieces from that today. Bob Fosse stories from there. The land of the drummer story, American story. And if you want to hear uh, a good story with Christopher Walken and Mikhail Rushnikov, you'll have to see the one man show. Uh, but thank you so much. It's been a very good audience. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, thank you again to Anton for setting up these uh, Fred Thursdays. And uh, looking forward to seeing. Oh, really important question. Uh, I know it's it was a little weird getting up here without any signage and wondering where the hell we were, especially since this is nearly all of our first times. The question is, how is this location and this room, or a room like this, for future events? Should we consider it? Is it horrible? Yeah, is it great? Is it okay? It's okay, but if it gets to be a regular and a lot more people come, then you might be a bit of a... Well, they may have bigger rooms. I'm just wondering in general... Is it Okay, chair is not so comfortable, good location, what else we got? Cost effectivity. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. We have to figure it out. Well, well, since we're not a bar or restaurant, we're not obligated to buy $12 cocktails. Thank you, and the cover chair. Mm -hmm. If coming in for me, that's a little bit Thank you all for coming.